Hi friends, welcome to Water Nerds. Um, I'm Kazaya, one of Hydra-V's Water Nerds, and today we're going to be discussing uh, this little thing that's been in the news, PFAS. What the heck? But we're going to talk about PFAS on military bases. What that means, uh, does it even count if most of us don't live on military bases? counts in a big way so that's what we're going to discuss today and today i have with me it's a full house right so today i have with me uh dr eric roy who's going to provide some uh some great insight and we also have our policy nerd annalise and so thank you for tuning in and hey let's go pfas all right i gotta say it slow per and no per or and and if okay <laughs> per and polyfluoral alkyl substances 10 times fast it's a challenge I, there's a, it's a challenge i want you to do that but that is what's been in the news like constantly like all over the country lots of military bases um what camp lejeune uh, mcclellan peas just all over the country military bases have pfas in their it's been discovered in their water and people are wondering what's going on what does that mean where is it coming from what can we do so i think a big a first big question is like where did it come from dr roy what would you yeah i mean pfas you know, I think it's, it's worth taking a step back. PFAS is a class of chemicals. It's not an individual chemical. Right. So it encapsulated, it, it includes all the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Mm -hmm. So it's a class of chemicals. On military bases, the big thing that they're using um, PFAS for are in the firefighting foams. So these are really, right. really useful things. The way that the foams work is it coats the fuel with a film and then the oxygen can't get to it so it's used in the firefighting training and operations gotcha. okay. on base. Okay. And of course when you spray something down with it now it's on the ground and then from that it can percolate into the groundwater. Right, right. So people with, this may be a little bit of a caveat, so people with, they use groundwater versus surface water which is like rivers and lakes. Groundwater is usually like wells and mm -hmm. things like that. So pe are people with groundwater more susceptible to maybe whatever dangers it may cause? They can be, and, and I guess the, the, the big thing to understand is groundwater is a very static thing compared to surface water. Okay. So a river, you imagine a surface water source like a river, if you contaminate a river and that flows through, if you stop the point source of contamination, kind of the contamination right. can flush its way out eventually. Right. Whereas with groundwater, it's more like a bowl that's being contaminated. Yikes. And, you know, the problem with PFAS, right, is they don't break down in the environment. Mm. So once it's there, it's there. And if you're drinking from a groundwater source, you might imagine that it's really hard to actually get down, down there and do something about it right. because there's, you know, the earth. So PFAS is a collection of chemicals. So that means it's man-made. It's a... Uh... Is it it's man made? Absolutely. There's there's no natural source of these chemicals. So it's not so it wouldn't I wouldn't imagine it would be like water soluble. No, they are. They're very water soluble and that's part of the problem. So mm. once they're once they're dissolved in the water, they mm -hmm. can actually spread laterally. So even if your contamination is here, it can because it's so soluble and mobile in the water, it right. can actually go left, right, up, down. Oh wow. Wow. So, I guess since it's on military bases, um, that would be the responsibility of the Department of Defense to do something about it, right? Would it? I mean, I, I don't know what who who has jurisdiction on this. Okay, but it's one of those things where when you have a source of contamination that's on a military base, it's mm -hmm. often not subject to the same regulations that it would if you're okay. in the private sector. Right, right. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. A lot of them are historical. Gotcha. But, but yeah, gotcha. I mean, the key thing is, if, if you do introduce these chemicals into a groundwater source and the military base happens to be above it, and local municipalities are also drawing from that same aquifer or whatever that is, you know, you can have that contamination can spread. It's mm -hmm. not just a point, you know, it, it, it can spread beyond that point source. So that's why it's, it, it also counts uh, for non-military families. It counts for whatever towns these military bases are in because it could absolutely it certainly can. contaminate absolutely. the groundwater outside can. of the bases. Wow. And, 
you know, it's one of those things like on base housing mm -hmm. is obviously impacted. Right. It can be impacted as can the surrounding surrounding communities. Absolutely. I think um, another thing to add to that is that um, local fire departments oftentimes go to military bases and air force bases to train because it yeah. provides like a really secure right. location for right. them to train either like new members of the team or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that also adds to just the amount of PFAS on these bases. So it's yeah. not only, wow. you know, military personnel that are using that space, it's, you know, fire departments that are coming in and using mm -hmm. the same area. And they need to train. I mean, right. That's the Absolutely. reality, right? Yeah. I mean, they got to do it. They got to yeah. do it, right. So uh, I was doing some research and it said that uh, the Department of Defense tested, has tested nearly 3,000 groundwater wells across the country yeah. um, and on base and off base and they discovered that 61 percent of those wells um, tested above EPA's recommended limits. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the kind of a, a, a trick here is that EPA's limits aren't enforceable, is that right? Yeah, correct. So, so like, they're kind of like health advisory levels whenever you hear that term mm -hmm. it's not it's a non-enforceable term that EPA kind of uses to say, well, we've done our research, we can't, it's not regulated yet, but this is what we can provide for you to kind of use it's as like a guideline. like what, what you should do. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's wow. 70 parts per trillion for the EPA, like lifetime health advisory level, mm -hmm. but obviously the scientific community and regulatory, other regulatory agencies. It should be lower, right? Like, yeah, like CDC believe that it should be a lot lower for drinking water. So for a person who's never really heard a term like 70 parts per trillion, like what is the 70 parts and what's the trillion? Like, what does that look like? It's a very low concentration. <laughs> I mean, we're talking yeah. like a drop of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. Oh, okay. For one part per trillion. For one part per trillion. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about wow. very, very dilute concentrations. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those things where sometimes municipalities and people that, that aren't, you know, big fans of environmental regulations, a lot of times they'll say, they'll try and use that to dismiss it. They're like, oh, it's just a drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Whereas toxicologists turn around and say, no, that's, that's an actual demonstration of how toxic these chemicals mm -hmm. actually are. That it's impactful enough to make a change at that concentration. At that concentration. Yes. And I think it's important to point out here as well that, you know, you had talked about almost 3,000 mm -hmm. wells, wells have been tested, tested. proactively mm -hmm. by Department of Defense. Right, which is, I think that's a big deal. Like, that's a huge deal. Yeah, they right. went for it. They don't they need to it. do that, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're trying to address the problem. So mm -hmm. I think that speaks a lot to the, to the leadership within DOD. Absolutely. Right. trying to take care of both you know, their on-base communities, their, their their personnel, and of course, you know, the larger communities. Because I think on the- are a big part of these communities. Absolutely, and because I, I think on the, the private side, like the municipality side, they haven't moved nearly this oh, fast. Yeah. Municipalities, you get, you get a lot of, we don't test because there's no requirement to do so, right. and then you have DOD like saying, okay, let's, Okay, well, we're gonna test ours. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and do it anyway. Yeah, right? absolutely. So it's pretty admirable. Absolutely. So, um, wow. Wow. So what does what so if DOD is doing this testing and, and really making an effort to um, see what the contamination looks like and like what they can do, what what space do local officials have? Like because I know that, like I said, once the contamination leave, you know, if it happens on base and it starts affecting surrounding municipalities in the base, um, what what can do local officials have a place like what can they what can they do um i mean it's really hard to say like the technology for filtering pfas at the municipal level just isn't really there yet mm. and on top of that it would be ridiculously expensive um but yeah just going back to the military bases and the voluntary testing that they're doing that municipalities aren't mm -hmm. um, i think that's really important to point out yeah, I, th I think municipalities should be taking the DOD's lead yeah. on this. But I, I think, I feel like... It's uncomfortable to do so. Right, and I think, uh, and probably the first thing they would say, though, municipalities would say, though, we don't have the money. Well, That's something. So... Prioritization. Mm -hmm. 
prioritization. Yeah. I mean, clean water is. <laughs> who needs it? Like, what are we doing? Right. <laughs> okay, so big question. People always want to know. Who do we blame? Like, whose fault is this? Who can we shake our finger at to say you poisoned our water? Like, what do where do where should people look? Because I know I know people want to know. So where do people look when they want to know? Like, whose fault is this? So I think it's just a combination of a lot of different things. But one being the chemical manufacturing companies and just the way that chemicals are regulated in this country like Mm -hmm. we don't really take a proactive approach to doing toxicity testing on humans we Mm -hmm. kind of just like put chemicals out in the market and then people get sick and then you know these and then it becomes a concern right exactly and then the companies start to pay attention and then maybe they'll make an alternative to the chemical that is less toxic or in the case of PFAS and Gen X Mm -hmm. is more toxic so I think that's part of it for sure goodness yeah but I would imagine, you know, just throwing it out there. I would imagine if I have a chemical company, say I'm like one of the big guys, say I'm DuPont, say I'm 3M, whoever, and I'm creating something that is going to be exposed to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe common sense would say, <laughs> let's see what kind of health hazards this may right. potentially cause instead of what it seems like the like you said like the approach has been yeah. like waiting until when someone calls foul like hey this is not working this is likely causing these problems and then it becomes like this big nationwide thing right. and it's like oh yeah we probably sh- like what i don't understand the logic so i think in part of that is probably the chemical manufacturing companies think that the benefits of these products outweigh the risk the risk so like besides firefighting foam um pfas is in scotch guard teflon you know products that have been around since the 1950s right so these chemical manufacturing companies are like well we're providing this great service and it's you know Ignore the small problem. Right. Well, right. Uh, let me let me jump in here as well. I think just playing devil's advocate as someone who works very closely with firefighters, mm-hmm. these foams work. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think we need to. It's all about balancing risk versus speed to market. And right now, the regulations, as Annalise, as you were talking about, are, are very much released now. Let's figure it out yeah. later. Mm-hmm. I think it's unrealistic that a chemical company is going to say, oh, well, we invented this thing. Let's test it for 40 years in right. a longitudinal study and see what happens. That, I mean, we just wouldn't push mm-hmm. anything ever new. So we just need to think about maybe, I, I look at this as someone who's come from industry as well, and maybe it's one of these things you just need to have like check-ins, <laughs> right? You release right. something. Let's keep refining our understanding Mm -hmm. of this and let's Mm -hmm. mandate that. Mm -hmm. And let's do a better job mandating that because, again, when it comes to firefighting, these things work. Absolutely, yeah. And I think one of the things that we haven't even touched upon today is the occupational hazard of these firefighters who are (laughs) using these foams, right? So we know that firefighters have a much higher risk of cancer than the general population. We know that. Mm -hmm. And... I think one of the things that a lot of people feel frustrated about is they just don't know that these things are toxic. So when they're what the, you know post fire and they're in their turnout gear or whatever, mm-hmm. and you know they're not educated necessarily on the how to of... decon themselves. Right. Right. So I think as part of the stage gate process, we need to make sure that okay, if we've learned something about the toxicity, yes. We also need to communicate that to the general public in a way that's much more transparent mm-hmm. than what we do right now, right? We just push, we just push live. We, when I say we, I mean the U.S. government mm-hmm. just pushed live what 800-page thing full of jargon on this stuff that it's bedtime material. Right, <laughs> it is. It's, it's a tough read. It's, it's a horrible it's read. A tough and read. And you certainly can't expect someone to do it. And I know that's what we're trying to convey here: is how do we how do we digest this stuff and get it out there? But I think maybe a mandated approach where it's mm-hmm. like check in, communicate in a real way, not just 
oh yeah, yeah. here's a report that no one's going to read. I think right. it's important that we really focus on the people who are impacted by right. this as well. So. Very true. And I think, um, you know, now companies like those big chemical companies, now, even if they have, didn't have it then, now they have uh, more uh, uh, technology to really navigate like making this as safe as possible effective still because like you said firefighting foam works like the stuff that we use that you know it, it works like yep. people still use teflon in their in their pans mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. still use scotch guard on their furniture mm -hmm. they still use foam for fires they work and so but i feel like now these companies as time progresses have there's more technology for them to be able to make it as safe as possible and also still effective. And I think it's important work. just to kind of look at the, the, the general timeline of what we knew and when, mm -hmm. right? When we're talking about is something preventable, right? there's some studies from what, the 70s or yeah. something looking at primates having issues. Is that true? Yeah, yep. So there, I think it was 3M that uh, did a study in the 70s that kind of was delayed, the release of it was a little bit delayed, mm. um, but there was a lot of primate mortalities and things like that in this study. So it's been around for a long time, it's been a problem for a long time, and you know maybe these chemical manufacturers have known about it, and since it hasn't been mandated, like you, like you said, to kind of check in on how these products are working in the environment. Right. Yeah. And maybe and they didn't. Go ahead. Sorry. So the other thing that I think is important to talk about a little bit is we didn't really have the technology to measure mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. So I think even the primate studies, right, that was mm -hmm. at occupational hazard. Right. Like you're using concentrated PFAS. Right. These are the factory workers. These mm -hmm. are the people who are using the pure chemical. But it wasn't until very recently that we actually had the ability to detect these things at concentrations found in the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's easy to play 2020 hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hindsight it's, is it's 2020. One, it, re it really is. But I think now that we have that technology available to mm -hmm. us, we should be looking at, okay, let's use that technology to figure this out. And there's some, right. there's some groups doing some incredible things with this. Like there's groups at NC State, and like we talked about earlier, the Department of Defense mm -hmm. is going in and, mm -hmm. and trying to at least assess the problem so we can fix it. So then it turns into the same thing that we, that we get back to. It's like, Okay, was it preventable? That's an academic conversation. We, there can be settlements like the $700 million settlement yeah. in Minnesota. That 3M did, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Goodness. what do we do in that interim? Right? We're, we're in this scenario. What do we do now? Um, I think there's a lot of conversations that we can have about who, who should be held accountable for this. But in the meantime, what do we do? And like Annalise spoke to, it's, it's really expensive to remove this stuff at the municipal level. Mm -hmm. So I think what needs to happen is if there are water filtration technologies out there that are, that are effective and inexpensive, we, I mean, obviously, we, we sell water filters, so we're biased. But, but at the same time, if for 150 bucks, mm -hmm. someone can prevent something very bad from happening. We have conversations with people on base families I mean, almost every day talking about it. They just wish they knew. Right. So I think it goes back to the what we're talking about, where it's like disclose and actually make aware yeah. of problems as they come about. Transparency. We can't, we, it's, yeah. it's all about transparency, yeah. right? Let true. people make those decisions. Legislation, si science and information is always going to move faster than the speed of legislation, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. But people should at least be aware of the problems as they, as they come about, right? Absolutely. And I think that... The fact that PFAS is just surfacing to the news now, and it really hasn't even started yet. Not really. Right? I don't think not, most people know what not PFAS really, is. Really, really, yeah. Right? So I know in Wilmington, everyone does. I know outside these bases in Colorado mm -hmm. Springs, mm -hmm. everyone does. There's public mm -hmm. things going on. But, like but this is about to be a giant yeah. thing on the news. There's no right question here. about this because as, as municipalities start to take the steps that DOD did, they're going to find that this stuff is... Everywhere, ubiquitous, much, right? Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah, the, and the it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. Really, they doesn't go anywhere. Really, uh, Department of Defense really set a precedent with how you respond. Perhaps. I mean, we'll, we'll see, right? So the question then becomes, 
what do you do now? What do you do now? So, you know, so I that's, and that was, that's no, actually no my last question. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, I that's actually my last question. So. Like, what does fixing it look like? Like, what does that mean? Well, I mean, there have been a number of technologies that have been evaluated. The group at NC State's done a really great job with this. There are a lot of reverse osmosis systems that do work. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, people who live in, you know, rental buildings probably aren't able to use them because you need to drill a pipe. Oh, okay. And you need to drill a countertop. Okay. So most landlords are like, uh-uh. Um, you know, full disclosure, we make water filters, but our water filters have been shown to be effective against PFAS. You know, reduce PFAS in the field to undetectable levels. That's an option, too. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of products out there that do not work. Um, there are a lot of big-name pitchers that people are like, oh, I use a blank pitcher. It's like, well... It doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. We've mm -hmm. tested these things. It just doesn't, doesn't work. work. You really need a very tight pore size. You need there. There are a number of technological things that you're just not going to get out of a ten dollar ten dollar filter, <laughs> right? And that's the reality of it. Yeah. So you know, I think those are the things that people, if they choose to take that step on their own, they can do. Um, make sure. I guess if we're if we're talking to you, if you're if you're looking for guidance on what to do if you are choosing a water filter. Demand from the manufacturer third-party data showing that PFAS are removed. That's all we'll say. There's going to be a lot of companies out there that insinuate that their products take it out. Demand third-party data. This is your water. This is your water. This is, it's ultimately in your hands. Mm -hmm. This is not something where the government's going to swoop in and fix it on time scales that probably you care about. So demand data. That's, I guess, the parting words that I would mm -hmm. have. Absolutely. Yeah. Any parting words, Annalise? Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Wow. Well, thank you guys so much. This has uh, been really, really enlightening, really informative. I hope we made it plain for you and made everything clear uh, about what PFAS, um, PFAS on basis means. Um, if you have any questions, uh, any concerns, feel free to drop us a line at hello at hydroviv.com. Or you can uh, come to hydroviv.com and drop into our chat, and you'll talk to a live person. Um, and yeah, we don't have robots. We don't have robots. They're expensive. <laughs> Do you know how much robots cost? <laughs> no, no robots. It's all live you'll people talk here. Someone who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> so drop us a line if you want to. Uh, hydroviv.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. We are water nerds. Thanks, Kazai. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Thanks, Annalise. Thanks.